In 1994, five of us decided we wanted to paddle the northern tributary of the Kogaluk River in northern Labrador. Two years earlier, three of us, my wife Wendy, Dick Irwin, and I, had paddled the Kogaluk, reaching it from the south. We fell in love with the stark beauty of this country and knew we wanted to see more. When we got to the rim of the Kogaluk, we were on the south rim, we could look across the 800-foot-deep canyon and see the northern tributary tumbling into the Kogaluk. I decided right then that I wanted to see the country that the tributary flowed through. Two years later, we made it happen. This is a map of Quebec and Labrador. The rectangle is where our trip was. So we started in Shefferville, went down the Depa River until it joined with the George River at Indian House Lake, and then did a portage up into the higher country through a series of lakes and portages, and eventually uh, crossing the height of land into Labrador, and then finding the head of our tributary. Then down the tributary into the Kogaluk River, and down the Kogaluk, uh, until it gets to the Labrador coast and then along the Labrador Sea to get to the town of Nain. So we start by taking the train, the Quebec North Shore and Labrador Railroad, out of Settille, Quebec. It's about a 12-hour train ride. About 20 kilometers north of Settille, the train enters a tunnel and when you come out, you're on a trestle above the rapids of the Moise River. And we spent the night in Shefferville, then got a ride to the iron arm of Lake Atikamagan and started paddling. For the first few days, we're traveling from lake to lake with some mostly short portages in between. At this point in the trip, our packs are really heavy, and we need to make three trips over the portages. We hit one section where the water wasn't quite deep enough to paddle, so you kind of slip and slide your way down, wading and uh, trying not to fall in the water too much. We woke up one morning to a fierce headwind and decided to paddle anyway because we knew if we could get to the head of this lake, we would have some wind protection for traveling later on. Early on in a trip especially, we like to get some extra miles in to make sure we have enough time to finish the trip because we're never sure what we're going to run into later. This is the portage right after Lac Jamin, and this is the start of what I think of as a proper Depa River, where it gets bigger with some real rapids. We had three canoes, and we all had uh, homemade spray skirts, so we could go in some of the water with bigger waves without worrying too much. Dick in his solo 30-pound uh, Kevlar boat, Kevlar Winona. So he would like to sneak around wherever he could and he'd be able to fit in places where we really couldn't with our boats due to both the extra width and the weight. So here he is sneaking around a pretty large drop.
this rapid was too shallow to paddle, so we waited and lined the boats down. For some reason, I never seem to be able to stay as dry as my companions when doing the lining. We've gone down the Depa a number of times, both to just to get to the George River and then to reach other rivers. And sometimes these rapids are uh, runnable and sometimes we've portaged them. Sometimes it depends on the river level and sometimes on our appetite for risks. Dave and Ann do a lot of back paddling and maneuver around. Here's Wendy and I again. Trying to line up for just one little narrow slot. And we hit it pretty nicely. Dick again sneaking around. And he's got a big smile for the camera. Here we are on Indian House Lake. We camp where we're going to start the portage the next morning. We have uh, lake trout for supper, and then the next morning we start heading up. You can see the black flies are out in force. The first part is a pretty steady climb to get out of the valley uh, of Indian House Lake. When we reached uh, sort of a flatter area, Wendy found a, a roughed out paddle that somebody had started to carve and never finished, just left there. Sam smoking a pipe to keep the bugs away. And we're heading towards that esker in the background. We're gonna camp there tonight and then it'll lead us towards our destination the next day. Yeah, we have breakfast at the base of the esker Then we head on out using the Esker as a highway for a while. Then we turn off in order to head east towards the lake. That's our destination. Uh. Oh, there you can see the water we're heading for. Dick discovered a, an old tent ring, an old fire pit, and some chopped wood at an old campsite. We're paddling up the lake to get to the next rapid, which will travel up the next day. We had a very scenic campsite right next to the rapid. The water there was just full of lake trout. And the next day we head up again, lining where we can or tracking upstream, occasionally paddling against the current just to get above a drop that may be hard to track up. And then finally, this is the portage into Lake Mistinibi, which is just a beautiful lake. From here, we're going to 
turn north into uh, another series of lakes to uh, start our search for the northern tributary. This is the portage into Lac Canane. The black flies were out that day. Some more tracking upstream. We camped at the base of that hill in the background. Even when we had lunch, we made a smudge fire to keep the bugs down. A little further on, we caught some landlocked char. As we got closer to the height of land, the country became more barren. And when the bugs weren't around, it just meant that there was a lot of wind. This is on Lac Brisson. One of the big lakes we paddled. The stream sections were fun. They were a bit of a challenge trying to find enough water to either paddle or wade and line without having to scratch the boat too much. On the map, this looked like a nice little stream we could paddle. So we ended up doing a little bit more portaging than we thought we might have to. Here we're getting close to the height of land, trying to figure out exactly where it is. It was all pretty much a soggy, flat plain. So here we, we figure we're at the height of land and we have a little celebration. Portaging the canoes in the wind presented some challenges. We used a leash system where someone would hold the rope attached to the bow or the stern to keep the canoe from getting too broadside to the wind. They didn't have to work very hard. A quick tug would keep the canoe lined up. Without such a system, picking up and carrying the canoe could be difficult at times. Putting in could be a problem with the wind and the rocks when you're balancing on boulders. And here we finally hit our tributary. We're heading downstream now. As we started down the river, we realized it was mostly navigable, but with quite a bit of wading and lining and some portaging. There were also really wonderful opportunities for hiking, especially with no trees. You could hike up a little bit and get great views of the country. Time for a rest occasionally. And then here is an old uh, winter tent site I think Dick found. And those are the stakes that would hold up a metal wood stove. As the river got a little bit bigger, <laughs> there were places you could run very carefully. The scenery stayed really nice and uh, so did the wind. You can see we have the tarp set up to protect us from the wind. And there were quite a few 
places wherever the river could spread out, it would, which uh, they were sort of like jigsaw puddle, puzzles of trying to figure out uh, how to get where you wanted to go. The occasional portage, again using uh, leashes for the canoes. And we did quite a bit of fishing, a lot of brook trout and some lake trout. This one was only hooked by its fin. Another great spot for hiking. There was something wonderful about that open landscape. It made you feel like you were at the top of the world. As the river grew, there were some more runnable rapids. See, by the way we're dressed, it was kind of cool temperatures for a lot of the time. So here was just the place we were going to go through some shallows and just trying to figure out the best way to go. When it's cold out, you don't want to be waiting too much. This is one of my favorite parts of the trip. We had a sandy area where the river made some hairpin turns through and around some eskers. We set up our tents behind some brush for wind protection. It felt like a real privilege to be able to spend time in this country. The river continued with some shallow rapids that could be mostly run or lined. weather continued to be cold and windy. Here we've got our tent set up behind the canoe as a wind block and Dick has set up his tent in the lee of ours. Not long before the tributary falls into the Kogola, there are a few more rapids that we can run. We're at the rim of the canyon. To my left is the rim of the tributary canyon. In front of me is the canyon of the Kogok. We had a very scenic campsite that night. We watched the tributary dropping 800 feet into the main river.
A patch of old snow provided ice for our drinks that evening. We're scouting a route down to the river. Dick was filming and narrating with his VHS camera while portaging his canoe and the pack. carrying a Winona solo canoe, Kevlar, it weighs 30 pounds, and I'm carrying a backpack with 20 pounds or 50 pounds, it's a comfortable load, especially for someone with a bad back, bad knees. Whoop, hit a rock. From our view from the South Rim in 1992, we knew that there were sheer cliffs where the tributary joined the main river. So we picked a route upstream of the tributary canyon. It was pretty steep in places, but was wooded, which made the descent easier. We were able to paddle the last bit of the tributary and finally reach the Kogaluk. The environment in the valley was very different than the high country we'd been traveling through. There were lots of trees, very little wind, and the ever-present valley walls. We were able to paddle almost all of the river with a few sections that had to be lined and one long section of continuous rapids that we could run. We encountered a school of fish swimming upstream. We wondered at first if they might be spawning Arctic char, but they turned out to be suckers. The valley got broader as we traveled downstream and the views are reminiscent of the lower valleys of the Ujituk and Notakwanan rivers. We spotted what looked like smoke rising from the woods. It turned out to be blowing sand and clay from the riverbanks. It was nice to have some warm and wind-free days with easy paddling after the rigors of paddling in the barrens. We camped near the head of Cabot Lake. The lake is notorious for having strong winds come funneling through, so we got up early and paddled most of the length of the lake. Near the eastern edge, we stopped on a beach for a late breakfast.
paddling down to the end of Cabot Lake. We're getting close to the mouth of the river. We hiked up a hill behind our campsite and ran into a bear. He wasn't very shy, but I think he wanted a word with the photographer. We're approaching the falls near the mouth of the river. There's a fishing camp not far below the falls. Before the trip, we had arranged for a boat to pick up Wendy and Anne at the fishing camp and take them to Nain, where they could fly out to get back to their jobs. Dave and Dick and I continued on the Labrador Sea and paddled to Nain. The coastline up to Nain is quite beautiful with good camping and hiking on the many islands. On the last night before getting to Nain, we found some mussels and Dave caught a char. We did the final push to Nain. In Nain, we stayed with the Moravian minister who we had met two years before. We arranged to have our canoes shipped to Goose Bay and then we flew out to get back to our vehicles in Setil and then to home. 